Veterans Day is the day that we thank those who are still living for the sacrifices that they have made, for the battles that they have fought. It is a time for us to honor those to whom honor is due. And I thought about getting our veterans who are present this morning to stand, but we're here to worship God. And this is a time and place for us to think about spiritual things, for us to honor and give memory to what He has done for us. And so instead of standing, I'll just offer you our thanks. Thank you to our veterans who have served, who have seen wars, who have been through battles and have survived. Thank you for the sacrifices that you have made. Tomorrow is a a parade and we're going to have a float in that parade and we would love to have as many as we can to, to participate in that parade, especially those of uh, those of you who are veterans. My brother is a veteran. He has been overseas several times, been deployed um, several times. My grandfather was in World War II. I never knew him. He died before I was born, but I have a belt that he wore in World War II, and that is an important memento to me. We do thank our veterans. It's a day when we, it's not like all of our other National holidays, it is a day when we thank those who have lived to tell the tale. We have a, an organization in our nation called the Veterans of Foreign Wars that seeks to help those veterans of ours. And we're going to take those words this morning and apply them to us spiritually as Christians, as the body of Christ, soldiers in the Lord's army. We are veterans, all of us here, we are veterans of a foreign war. We're going to examine each of those three words, veterans, foreign, and war, this morning. But before we do, I want to give you some statistics about veterans in our nation. From the accounts that I could find, there are somewhere between 20 and 22 million veterans living in our nation today. Going back to World War II, I believe is the the last World War I veteran died in 2011. I can remember as a young person uh, meeting and knowing some World War I veterans, but World War II, now there are about, best estimates, around 500,000 World War II veterans still living today. And according to the statistics that I saw, Veterans are dying at about a rate of about 372 a day. That's from those who have grown old and age has taken them to those who are most recent veterans of our wars and our conflicts that may be committing suicide at a rate that is higher than we would like to know. It is a real threat. It is a real problem. We'll talk about that a little later. But we're losing veterans very quickly. In fact, there is about a 2% decrease in the number of veterans every year because of that rate. There are uh, somewhere between 5 and 7 million Vietnam veterans, maybe about 1 or 2 million Korean War veterans. And for all of these, we thank you for your service. There are veterans all around us. But what I want us to think about this morning is how we as Christians are veterans. We should feel like veterans. We should understand the war in which we're engaged, the battles that we wage every day, and how God has given us the victory already. Just as we thank the veterans of our nation, we need to be ready to support, to uplift, to encourage our veterans in this spiritual warfare, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So let's begin with that idea of being a veteran. We are indeed veterans. And as veterans, that means a few things to us. I can remember as a, uh, as a boy, my, the passage I believe that helped me make the decision to become a Christian is Ephesians 1 verse 7. I can remember this one and my father using this in his sermons and and growing up in a Christian household and the son of a preacher, it's it's always present. You're always thinking about it. It's always before your 
your eyes? When am I going to be obedient to the gospel? At what age? When? Um, how old do I need to be? This is the one verse that really stuck with me and caused me, I believe, at last to make that decision, to enlist in the Lord's army. As veterans, it means that we have signed up for this. It means that we have made the choice to serve in this military. It's a spiritual military, but we enlisted. Do you remember those old posters? You've probably seen them. Uncle Sam saying, I want you. This is what the gospel call is. When Jesus invites us into his rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, he's inviting us to take his yoke upon him, to enlist with him, to fight alongside our brothers and sisters in Christ. But it's a choice that we make when we know and when we understand, when we appreciate the promises and the blessings that are ours by being in Christ Jesus, it is something that we want to do. It's a volunteer basis that we serve on. But we enlist in this army. We're veterans because we enlisted. The verse that caused me to enlist was Ephesians 1 verse 7, where Paul says, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood." the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. There's so much there. We have redemption through His blood. Jesus made the sacrifice for us. That demonstrates the love of God more perfectly than we could ever appreciate. While we were yet sinners, Romans 5, verse 8 and 9, Christ died for us. Through His blood, we have redemption. We have our sins forgiven. It is as if we never committed those sins. Those are the riches of grace that God offers us when we enlist. There is something appealing about the gospel. Just as the, the thought of fighting for our nation, the, uh, the posters, the images of Uncle Sam inviting us to enlist in the army, there's something appealing about the gospel of Christ. It calls us to a different life. And when we respond to that call, it is because we understand and appreciate what God has done for us. We're veterans, and first of all, that means that we have enlisted in the Lord's army. It also means that we each have different roles in this spiritual military. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the church is described as the body of Christ, and each of us has a different role, just as every organ in our bodies has a different function, the eyes, the ears, the hands, the feet. Each of us as Christians have different roles in this military, in the spiritual military. We're not all going to be doing the same things. You may think of the front lines as the one who's up here preaching or the elders, the ones who are shepherding the flock. I think of the front lines as those of you who go to work in a wicked, sinful world every day. That's the front lines of the military. That's where the real battles are being fought. That's where you are engaging the enemy. But we all have different roles. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, as David is on the run from Saul, Saul is still seeking and attempting to kill David to prevent him from being the next king of Israel. David behaves himself wisely the Amaleks have attacked, the Amalekites have attacked, and, and, and Saul's going to be killed by the Philistines in, in the very next chapter, in chapter 31 in 1 Samuel. But here the Amalekites have attacked, and David has to defend the people of Israel against the Amalekites, and he's successful. Verse 18 of 1 Samuel 30 says, David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his Two wives, there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. There were 200 men, verse 21, who didn't go with the rest of the the soldiers in to fight the Amalekites. And those 200 men, David caused to stay with the stuff. They had a different role for this battle. And yet they all partook in the rewards. 
in the spoils. Verse 21, David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to them, he saluted them. Now drop down to verse 23. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. The rest of the people wanted to withhold the spoils from those who had stayed behind with the stuff. David said, You will not do so with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered us the company that came against us into our hand. For who, for who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. We have different roles. We serve different functions. We fight different battles, but we all receive the same reward. Our part will be alike. We're working together in this battle, in this war. We're fighting side by side, even though our battles may be different. We are veterans, and that means we've enlisted. We've chosen to fight. And that means that our roles may be different from our brothers and sisters, but we're all fighting battles. It also means that we have seen, indeed, live action. We have been put to the test. We have been, as it were, persecuted for our faith, for professing that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, for trying to convince others to enlist in this spiritual army. That means that we have seen action. Are you a soldier who has actually seen action? Peter talks about this all throughout the book of 1 Peter, his first general epistle. Now Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that when men persecute us and revile us and say all manner of things evil against us for His name's sake, that we should rejoice. And that's exactly what Peter says here. Peter is encouraging soldiers in the Lord's army in 1 Peter to take heart, to be encouraged because they are in the battle every day. They are seeing this action. He says in 1 Peter chapter 4 that we should rejoice, verse 13, rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Christ was fighting that battle. He was put to the death physically because of it. And it may come to the point where we are persecuted physically because of our faith, because of what we profess to believe, because of what we want to do for others. We may be persecuted just as Christ was persecuted, but that's a reason to rejoice. Rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And then he says in verse 16, If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. We are in the action. We are on the battlefront. And that is a reason for us to rejoice. Because as veterans of this foreign war, as veterans in the army of the Lord, as veterans in this spiritual battle, we're going to survive every fight. In fact, what God has promised us is that while we are living on this earth, in the physical fleshly bodies that we inhabit, We cannot lose spiritually. If we trust Him, if we faithfully fight for Him, the victory is assured for us. As veterans, it means that we've seen action and we have survived. There is no force on earth, physical or spiritual, Romans 8 verses 38 and 39, that can separate us from the love of God. We will always survive. We will always win the victory. It may take a long and concerted effort. It may take a lifetime of enduring persecution. But God has promised us that we will survive. We will be veterans. We may physically perish. But there is no force on earth that can conquer us spiritually. In John 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says it this way, There is no one that can pluck you from my Father's hand. Do you understand what that means? It means that we cannot die on our battlefield. It will not happen. 
in leading the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, in the conquest of the promised land after they had come out of Egypt and Moses had handed over the leadership of the people to Joshua, it was God's intention that they never lose a battle and they never lose a man in those fights. But because of their presumptuous sin, after they had taken Jericho, they went up to Ai, they lost some men in that battle. That never should have happened. They shouldn't have lost a single person on that battlefield because they were trusting in God. And God has promised us, because we're fighting a foreign war, we're fighting a spiritual battle, that we don't have to die on that battlefield. There is no force on earth, physical or spiritual, that can take our salvation from us when we have enlisted in the service of God. Now, we can choose to go AWOL. We can choose to turn our backs on God, but there is nothing that can separate us from our God, from the love that He has shown to us. There is no one that can pluck us from the Father's hand. We're veterans. That means we've enlisted of our own free will. It means that we are engaged in the battle daily, and it means that we are surviving. We will live. We're thriving, even if our bodies perish which none of us really have a concern about because we don't face that kind of persecution in our nation. But we do have brothers and sisters across this world who are. Even if that were to happen, we know that the victory ultimately is ours because Jesus was resurrected from the dead by the glory of the Father. Our fate will be the same. And that's what we're fighting for. That's why we enlisted. That's what our hope is. And that's how we know that we're going to survive spiritually. We are veterans but we are veterans in a foreign war. Our war is not flesh and blood. As we read this morning, Ephesians 6, verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're not fighting a physical battle, even when our bodies are fighting against us. Even as age and disease may wear on us, our battle is still not physical. Now those physical concerns and those physical maladies, they may affect us spiritually, but that's why we're a brotherhood. That's why we are an army. That's why we are a force. Because we support one another. We help one another. Our battles are not physical. They are not flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our our battle is not carnal, in other words. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, verse 4. He says in verse 3, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Our war is not carnal, it's not flesh and blood, it is spiritual? Are we fighting on that front? We give so much concern, so much time, and so much energy to our physical well-being. I have to question, are we actually putting the effort into fighting spiritual battles, confronting the enemy, engaging the enemy, knowing how to defeat the enemy in our own lives? Are we devoting as much effort to fighting that spiritual battle as we are the flesh and blood physical battles that we fight every day. What this begs the question is, who is our enemy? If our battle is not against flesh and blood, if our struggle is not against the physical, then who is our spiritual enemy? We'll answer that in just a moment. What we need to understand about the difference between Christianity, between faith in Jesus Christ, discipleship to the Son of God, and other world religions, especially the religion of Islam, is that we're fighting a foreign war, we're fighting spiritual battles, and that means that we never at any time seek our enemy's physical death. Not for any reason. It is for this reason that I could never enlist in a physical army. I would be a conscientious objector if there was a draft. 
I would have to declare that I cannot seek the death, the physical death of another person because our battle is spiritual. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We are never commanded by God to seek the death, the physical death of our enemies. Whereas the Quran, the, the, the nation of Islam, they are on a mission to kill, to destroy their enemies in the flesh, anyone of a different belief system than they. But Jesus has given us a religion of peace, the true religion of peace. We don't seek, we don't seek a physical confrontation. We don't seek physical death. We have beaten our swords into plowshares. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But we are involved in a war. We are fighting this battle. How much effort, how much energy are you putting into your spiritual preparation, into wearing the, the armor of God? How much proficiency do you have with wielding the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? We have enlisted. We are veterans. We are surviving. Our, our battle is not physical. It is on the spiritual front, but we are indeed in a war. As we just read Ephesians 6 verse 12, who is our enemy if we're not fighting against flesh and blood, if we're not fighting against uh, carnal things, if we're not fighting against the physical things, who is our enemy? Of course, Satan is our enemy. He's a roaring lion, Peter says, walking about seeking whom he may devour. But when we think of just Satan, we try to personify him. We try to identify him and we accuse him of being our enemy. Sometimes we miss out on a lot of other things that are enemies in our spiritual lives. It's not just Satan himself. We think of him sometimes as a demon figure with horns and a pitchfork and a tail. But there are so many other small things, we might say, in, con in comparison that are truly our enemies that we allow into our spiritual lives without ever putting up a fight, without putting up our defenses. I'm talking about division among brethren. This is our enemy. Just as we know that Satan is opposed to all that we stand for, division is completely contrary to what God expects in His army, in His military. Paul says that we as Christians in the body of Christ are to be of the same mind and the same judgment in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. Jesus prayed for us to have unity. And so division is our enemy. We should seek the truth of God's Word on every matter that can possibly divide us as the church. Hatred is our enemy. Hatred of anyone for any reason is an enemy that we should fight against daily in our lives. Whether it's because of a skin color, whether it is because of a nationality, whether it is because of the football team that we pull for. Hatred has no place in our lives. It is an enemy against which we are fighting. Sin, the sins that we commit, whether they are in the flesh, whether it is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. All sin is our enemy. Apathy is our enemy. We need to specifically identify the spiritual enemies that we're fighting against in our lives. Just to say that Satan, the devil, is the enemy makes it too impersonal. It means that we're fighting against someone that we'll never see and we cannot identify. But when we narrow it down to the specific things that we deal with, then we know where that battle is. We know how to fight. We know how to equip the Word of God as our sword and faith as our shield to defend us against these enemies. But we are in that war. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that no man that warreth, <clears throat> no man that engages in this war, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. It's a spiritual battle. He says in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We enlisted. We heard the call. 
We saw the blessings and the benefits of signing up to be in the Lord's army. He has chosen us in that sense to be a soldier on His behalf. As soldiers of Jesus Christ, we must endure hardness. We must be willing to fight the battles knowing that we will survive, knowing that no one can separate us, knowing that in the end we will be resurrected to live eternally in heaven with God. What a great thought. What a great hope that we have that the rest of the world misses out on. And as soldiers for Jesus Christ, we do not entangle ourselves in the affairs of this world. The enemy is knowable. The enemy is in our lives every day. But we must be equipped. We must be engaged. And we must know that no matter what we face, no matter what happens to us, we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Veterans today face a very difficult existence. There are problems that veterans emotional and spiritual problems that they face that maybe some of us cannot appreciate. They've seen things. They've experienced things. They've done things many times that they have a difficult time sharing, that they have a difficult time accepting in their own lives. As we were in Columbus, Georgia, there is a very large base there. It's where many who go through the Army do their basic training, Fort Benning, And we had several soldiers who would come through the congregation where we were working there. And it seems to me that every one of them, without exception, was suffering from PTSD. Some would admit it. Some were seeking help with it. Some would deny it. PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. It is a traumatic existence. It is a traumatic service that they have enlisted in. They have seen these things that cause trauma in their minds and in their spirit because they've been in physical battles. And because of that, they deal with thoughts of suicide. They deal with survivor's remorse. As veterans of a spiritual battle, as veterans of this foreign war in the Lord's service, the trauma that we face is not physical. The trauma that we face is not something that should drive us to thoughts of suicide. But the trauma that we face is something that we know has already been dealt with. It's already been provided a way for us to overcome it. The spiritual trauma that we face, we have an opportunity to be victorious over through Jesus Christ. The Lord's army is a place where we support one another, where we lift each other up, where we help each other because each of us is engaged every day. Are you fighting the battle? Are you enlisted? Do you know what awaits you in the army of God? There are blessings eternal that only exist in Christ Jesus. And you have the opportunity this morning to sign up, to begin fighting, Maybe you realize this is a decision you've never made. You've never fully put on the armor of God. Now is the opportunity. He wants you. He's calling you. He has provided glorious blessings in His presence here and in eternity. Repenting of sin, confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and you can be immersed in water this morning, and your sins will be washed away. At that moment, you put on Christ. You put on the spiritual armor. You're growing, you're learning, you're getting better as a soldier in the Lord's army. But you've got a battle to fight. You've got a a life to live. And you can do that this morning if you never have. And if you have, but you recognize you're not fighting, something uh, something that you've done, something that you've said has caused you to give up on the fight. Something that you've experienced is preventing you from being active in this war. You are letting sin have the victory over you. Won't you repent? Won't you confess? We stand ready to assist you if you have any need. Won't you come forward while we stand and sing?